Welcome colleagues. My name is Lillian Mills. I'm the interim dean of the Macomb School of Business. And I am so proud that Rob Kaplan is here and appreciate his government service. I had the pleasure of serving in the US Treasury Department for a year back in 2005. And I am a tax accounting professor, so I am highly interested in today's webinar. I want to remind you that there will be time for questions after the formal interview, and you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. I'll, it'll probably be about 20 minutes from now before I take a look at those questions. And Mr. Kaplan has generously agreed to stay a little past our 45 minute advertised window if there are an abundance of questions. And thank you, Rob. We'll stay flexible for that, but we'll do a hard stop at 55 minutes. So an introduction. Mr. Rob Kaplan is currently the 13th president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and he represents the 11th Federal Reserve District on the Federal Open Market Committee in formulating U.S. monetary policy. Rob was previously the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice and a Senior Associate Dean at Harvard Business School. He served as Vice Chairman of the Goldman Sachs Group, Inc., with global responsibility for the firm's investment banking and investment management divisions. And Rob also provides much public service in public health and other spheres, including chairing Project ALS, co-chairing the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, and serving as a board member on both Harvard's Med School and the Kansas Health Policy Authority Board. Uh, born and raised in Prairie Village, Kansas, Rob earned a BS in Business Administration from the University of Kansas and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome, Rob. And I want to start with the national economy and give you a chance to set the stage. Tell us in broad terms your views about our current U.S. economy. Okay. Uh, and and uh, thank you, Dean Mills. I know you want me to call you Lil, but thank you for thank you for having me. It's great to be uh, here at Macombs with all of you. Uh, so I, I might just take it as we discuss. So I might take five or ten minutes just to lay out the thumbnail of the four or five key things we're seeing, and then throw it back to you. And we'll just do Q and A. Uh, but the, the long and the short of it: uh, first, our forecast at the Dallas Fed for 2021 is that GDP will grow roughly six and a half percent. There are some private forecasters have stronger estimates than that, but our baseline is six and a half percent and that the unemployment rate will, uh, will drift down toward 4% by the end of 2021. Um, in terms of inflation, uh, a lot's been discussed about that recently. I don't need to tell you. Uh, we are uh, we are seen and we've been seen for a number of weeks through all our outreach uh, and and discussions across the district. We're seeing supply demand imbalances, logistics supply chain issues for a whole range of goods. That's not new news. Um, uh, the, the issue is how long will it take to resolve those imbalances? Contacts tell me in some industries that those goods imbalances can get resolved in the next six to 12 months in some cases. But I think there's, there's significant uncertainty on other items, how long it will take. And in addition to goods, there's supply demand imbalances uh, in, um, in the labor force, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And we saw some evidence of that, I think last Friday, where uh, there are, uh, it's gonna take a while to resolve the supply demand imbalances. And I'll talk about the reasons why uh, for that in a moment. Uh, but what, what you worry about and what I watch very carefully is depending on how long it takes to resolve these supply demand imbalances, do these start to feed into inflation expectations? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm watching very, very carefully uh, because at the Fed, while, we're, while I'm willing to let inflation run moderately, 
above 2% for some time. I'm also committed to anchoring inflation and inflation expectations at 2%. Um, now, I talked about uh, supply demand of labor. Um, let, let's just talk about for a moment, this pandemic is very different than the Great Recession uh, in that what we've seen because of substantial fiscal policy, household income in this downturn actually didn't go down. Consumer spending stayed strong. Uh, and as a result of that, we had a much less severe contraction than we would have had in 2020. And, um, and it's playing a big role fiscal policy in 2021. But what we are seeing is uh, if you've got a college education, it's very likely that, uh, that you're able to work remotely last year and into this year. Uh, you it's less likely you've lost your job and it's more likely that this, uh, this pandemic, while maybe traumatic, it's more likely you've weathered it pretty well on average. If on the, one, on the other hand, you're one of the 46 million high school educated workers in this country, it's far more likely you work in a person-to-person -person contact industry. It's far more likely that you lost your job, you can't work remotely, and fiscal policy, unemployment insurance was critical to helping you make ends meet. We've also seen uh, that women with children have disproportionately been negatively affected through this pandemic uh, because schools have not been reopened in person and there's a lack of access to good childcare in addition. And so, so it's our estimate that as many as a million and a half women uh, currently have left the workforce since February 2020 and have chosen often to be home caring for kids. And, and so one of the big challenges is getting those workers back. Um, so that leads me into probably the last comment or two I'll make, and that is what we saw in the, uh, in the jobs report last week. Um, when I talk about labor supply demand issues, uh, there are a few areas. I just talked about one, women right. who've left the workforce. Number two, it's our best estimate at the Dallas Fed that since February 2020, approximately 2 million workers who were employed in February 2020 who are 55 year old, years old and older have left the workforce and in fact indicated they've retired. Ah. Now we know this has been a long-term trend because of aging, but, but that's a substantial uh, bite out of supply. And then the third thing we're very aware of, I talked about high school educated and less person-to-person -person contact industries, even though that's reopening, uh, we are hearing widespread reports of difficulty hiring people making 12 to $15 an hour. And one of the reasons is the unemployment insurance alternative uh, is, is pretty attractive versus that. And we're seeing and hearing that reports of people standing out and waiting and it's been very hard for businesses to hire, even though they're paying signing bonuses and doing other things. The other two pieces of the puzzle I'll just comment on is we're hearing among junior colleges that skills training enrollment has dropped precipitously since the start of the pandemic, particularly for Black and Hispanic students. Okay. That is a big deal to us because you need a good pipeline of skilled labor. And what we've heard is that pipeline has been impeded, probably due to a loss of a part-time job or lack of access to Wi-Fi. Um, and then the one other thing which we saw in the jobs report uh, is you saw the one group that had a surge in, higher, in participation and entering the workforce were 16 to 19 year olds. Normally you'd say, gee, that's a good thing. But if you talk to high school superintendents, which we, which I do and we do through the state, what they're telling us is uh, they're seeing a lower percentage of their high school seniors graduate this year. And so what I wor you worry about is people not even getting their GED, entering the workforce, but there means they're, they need a GED later to go for skills training. And so it just tells me that you're seeing these different imbalances are going to have to work themselves out and that's gonna take some time. But we're watching this carefully uh, 
Uh, and, and I guess I can talk about other issues, excesses and imbalances, but why don't I do that in the Q&A and I'll throw it back to you, Lil. Right, thanks, Rob. Um, I did have a chance to glance at the Q&A and there are a couple of questions about inflation, but those seem more specific than my next question. And I wanted to start more broadly with your views on monetary policy. So you've said that you think the Fed should at least discuss tapering its monthly purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And can you expand on your thinking about that a little bit? And yeah. then maybe so, I'll tee up one of these inflation questions. Right. So, what, so what, I, what, I've, what I've said is this, while we were in a crisis, which we were last year, mm -hmm. I was very supportive and said publicly, repeatedly, the Fed should be aggressively uh, using its tools, uh, not only in the Fed funds rate, these 13-3 programs, but also buying 80 billion of treasuries and 40 billion of mortgage-backed securities per month. And I thought it was very important that we take these extraordinary measures while we're in the middle of a crisis. But I would say, as I would say at this point, as it's clear and it becomes clearer that we're emerging from this pandemic. Uh, and we're getting there, that we're emerging from this pandemic, and we're making substantial progress in the economy toward full employment and price stability, I think it would be healthy uh, to, to begin the process in the not too distant future, sooner rather than later, uh, beginning to at least discuss right. weaning off these extraordinary measures. And for me, specifically, I'm referring to buying 80 billion of treasuries and 40 billion of mortgage-backed securities. And let me, can I just explain? Let me explain sure. why. There's some excesses and balances I'm observing. I worry about excess risk-taking in the financial markets, very tight credit spreads. Mm -hmm. I worry in particular about leverage and excess risk-taking build building up in the non-bank financial market. I worry about some of these excesses and balances we just talked about in the economy. But in addition, I focus on the housing market, and I'll use that as an example. Uh, we buy 40 billion of mortgage-backed securities every month. Uh, and that's helped during the pandemic bolster the housing market. I think it's been healthy. However, at this stage, home prices are now at historically elevated levels. And in addition, increasingly over the last six to eight weeks, I'm hearing more and more widespread reports of private investors entering the single, fam single family housing market, competing with families, often making bids sight unseen, above the asking price, and, and requesting that the house remain furnished. Okay, and so we're in a position where single families are actually being crowded out or squeezed out of being able to buy their first home and I just go back, and this is an example of an excess, maybe an unattended consequence, a side effect of these extraordinary actions, which in a crisis, the benefits of these extraordinary actions over outweigh the side effects. As we emerge, I think that balancing calculation starts to change. And I worry about a side effect like that. And again, thinking as we approach uh, weathering the pandemic, and we continue to do that, and we're making progress, substantial further progress in the economy, I would prefer to be talking about, uh, for example, the mortgage purchases sooner rather than later. I think it would be healthy. Uh, and I think as we emerge from this pandemic, I think those kinds of discussions and uh, beginning the process of weaning off some of these extraordinary actions, particularly some of these purchases, I think is a healthy thing. Thank you, Rob. Um I think I could squeeze in a question. I'm looking at David Tuttle's and Larry O'Brien's questions about inflation. And between the two of them, they're asking a little bit about why is 2% the right target? And how do you think about what uh, causes the expectations to become unanchored? So okay. if you so, related, we can take those now. So s several years ago, and I think to be precise, about 10 years ago, the, the Federal Open Market Committee, predates me, made a decision that uh, we, want, we, are, we have a dual mandate, full employment and price stability, 
and they made a decision to articulate the price stability goal as a 2% target, symmetrical. We don't want to run persistently below 2%. We don't want to run persistently above. I think the thought was, and I actually, for my taste, I agree with this. I think we haven't been through it. There have been periods in our history we went through a severe deflationary period, and that can be very pernicious. Mm -hmm. And you also don't want to go through uh, uh, excesses with inflation too high. And I think the thought was, and I, I think I basically agree, that 2% plus or minus is probably uh, helps you avoid deflation, but also is low enough that it helps you avoid excess deflation. So it's all in the spirit of price stability. Here's what you worry about, uh, what you're concerned about. I want to anchor inflation expectations at 2%. But in our effort to do that, if you, if you have excesses and imbalances or uh, supply-demand issues mm -hmm. on goods and on labor, what you don't know is, depend on how long that goes on, uh, whether it starts to get embedded in expectations. And that's what, and, and you worry that then inflation expectations start to get more elevated and that you're, uh, you're getting them elevated to a level that uh, is not consistent with anchoring them at 2%. And that's, that's the part I'm concerned about. This is a risk for me. And I'm, again, I'm a business person. I'm not a PhD economist, but I come at it. I, I come from a risk management background. I'm a business right. person. So I'm accustomed to looking at a, a range of outcomes and ex acknowledging that there's always a range of outcomes as opposed to saying it's gonna be this or that. We do heavy analysis here. We talk to contacts and there are various scenarios we do. And, and I think a little bit for me, you, you wanna apply some then risk management uh, to, to realize that there may be outcomes that happen that may not be exactly what you expect. And that's the mindset I have in some of my comments. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, on the employment issue, I'm in New York City this year. It's hard, to, or this week, it's been hard to get a cab. There are not as many cab drivers. And what I'm hearing is uh, some of them are choosing to not be driving right now. Um, but let's bring it closer home to Texas and talk about the Texas economy. What do you see as our state's headwinds and tailwinds? So the downturn last year and the recovery uh, since the end of the second quarter in the third and fourth quarter into today, I would say has mirrored the shape of the U.S. recovery. You know, we had very strong rebound in the third quarter. We had some fits and starts due to resurgence of the virus, like many other parts of the country. And we're, we're growing at a very rapid rate uh, in 2021. There's one big difference, though between the Texas economy and the rest of the country, and that is uh, migration of people and firms to the state. So the story of Texas for the last 20 years is greater diversification. We'll talk at some point about the energy business, but not right now, but in the Q&A. But we've diversified to a much broader range of industries, and our population growth has been higher than the rest of the country. And one big reason is migration of people and firms. In other words, people are moving here. Since the start of the pandemic, that migration of anything has accelerated. Right. Uh, and many people in this audience know what I'm talking about. People are moving from California, East Coast, to Illinois. And so it bodes very well for our population growth. Why that's so important? GDP growth is made up of growth in the workforce plus growth in productivity. And our population growth has outpaced and I think will continue to outpace the rest of the country for an extended period of time. So I, I think uh, we've got the wind at our backs. We have a great chance to outperform. And so then the question is, wh what are we gonna do about, what are we gonna do with that great hand? You've gotta make sure we invest in infrastructure, in my opinion, early childhood literacy, education, skills training, healthcare access. As long as we make those investments, I think we've got a great chance to outperform uh, the rest of the nation for a long time. Uh, I'd like to see the nation perform better. And if the nation does better, we'll do better also. Of course. Yes. And um, it's a great place 
and time to be at Texas Macomb. So we welcome yeah, really your is. entrance of business and wealth managers and everyone else to Texas. So that's been great, um, both for President Hartzell and uh, being Dean of the Macomb School. So um, you're going to be uh, ha hosting a conference next week about technology-enabled disruption on the economy, the workforce, higher education. And I'd love for you to tee up what you expect to be major takeaways both from the trend and from the conference you're hosting. Okay, so this will be our third, thank you for mentioning it. This will be our third technology-enabled disruption conference. And so why did this come about? After I spent a couple of years, uh, uh, two, two and a half, three years at the Fed, there's, there's a, I wanted to make sure that we have a focus always on cyclical factors and there's a tendency to folk over-focus on cyclical factors, okay? Short-term data, cyclical trends, you know, what's the impact this year of fiscal policy and the here and now. But there are some very powerful structural forces, secular forces that are unfolding. Aging of the population, mm -hmm. uh, technology replacing people and technology-enabled disruption is one of those powerful structural trends. If anything, it's accelerated as a result of the pandemic. What's the meaning of it? And why do we want to do a conference on it? Number one, it affects businesses and their pricing power and also the way they're thinking about what to invest in. Almost every business that I talk with is investing more in technology mm -hmm. because they have to. They may or may not be able to pass that cost in, in terms of prices to, to customers or clients. But more than that, there's almost in every industry, including higher education, disruptive entrants, technology enabled, that are limiting the pricing power of those incumbent businesses. So at the Fed, we want to understand that trend. It's one of the reasons why inflation leading up to the pandemic had been more muted. Technology, technology enabled disruption was limiting price and power. The other reason I want to study it is it has a significant effect on the workforce, particularly on those workers with high school educations or less. If you've got a college education, you may be some traumas from technology and disruption but you have the skills to adapt. My concern is technology, technology enabled disruption, unless we invest more in education and adaptability, high school educated and less workers are finding the impact of technology on them personally. It's causing their job to be restructured or eliminated. And during the course of their career, if they don't get retrained, they may actually be seeing their incomes go down, not up. And so we, we spent a lot of time on this subject because of the implications for the workforce and for the education system. Thanks, Rob. And let's, you said we could talk about the energy sector. And yes, that's let's. important globally, but particularly in Texas. And that's also been in a bit of a disruption in. Yes. Um, so, what can you tell us about your energy market outlook and then the interplay between fossil fuels and renewables? Okay. So we have, we have the biggest energy group, doesn't, not surprisingly, in the Federal Reserve System. And we have a substantial commitment, not just to fossil fuels, but to understand the energy ecosystem generally. Right. Um, and so, number one, it's old news now, but the industry faced a demand disruption and a supply disruption last year. Yeah. Uh, on the demand side, COVID. On the supply side, uh, COVID created enormous amount of excess inventory. And at the same time, Saudi Arabia plus Russia decided actually in the spring to increase production. We are just now uh, making, we're making progress and been making progress toward working off that excess inventory, but we don't think it's going to be uh, until the end of the year, this year, or beginning of next year that we've worked off all the excess inventory as a result of those disruptions. But we're, we're getting there. Uh, and we're seeing prices firm as a result. Uh, the industry is merged. Uh, highly leveraged players have failed or consolidated. I think the industry has adapted substantially to these trends already. A lot of people say, what's the industry going to do? It's done it. Okay. And the issue is the following. 
we, we produced at the end of last year about 11 million barrels a day in the United States uh, in oil. Mm -hmm. We think production this year is going to go up modestly, maybe only to 11 and a quarter, 11 and a half. A lot of people su be surprised about that. The industry has committed to its shareholders that it will use cash flow increasingly to return cash. And a smaller percentage of cash flow is going to drilling. The implications of that are, as we make this substantial transition in the economy to more wind, solar, battery storage, and these all these advanced techniques, um, which the industry is spending itself billions on right. to try to produce in a cleaner way and investing in these, the challenge is, if you don't do this transition carefully, we need a healthy fossil fuel industry right. because our research shows even with the most aggressive assumptions on wind and solar and alternatives, we're going to need demand. We're going to have strong demand for fossil fuels, not for years, but for decades. Right. So the challenge, which we've been emphasizing, how do you maintain a healthy fossil fuel industry, even though it's a smaller and smaller percentage of the total? I, I think we've got to be keep a close eye on that challenge. Because the danger is if we don't get this right, you'll have price spikes, which affect millions of consumers in the United States and particularly the people least able to absorb the price spikes. So this is something we're spending a lot of time on uh, and, uh, and are concerned about. Well, Rob, I share your concern and the priority. I, at, at Texas, we have the K. Bailey Hutchison Energy Center that uh, brings law and business together to really think about these policies a lot and a brand new sustainability institute that hopes to be a thought leader in wow. not an alternative, but as you say, how can traditional energy use its supply chains and all of its expertise to, to contribute in global solutions. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's as important to the Fed as it is to Texas McCombs. Yeah, very um, so uh, as a final uh, planned question before I really try to digest that we have 31 questions in the Q&A, um, you're very involved in public service and we've got a large and diverse audience of business leaders, community and civic leaders and students. Do you have any broad advice for how each of us uh, should be leaning in to take action and improve our communities? Um, well, I think that's a great question. Uh, let me direct my comments to the, to the um, well, I guess I was about to say to the students in right. particular, but, uh, my, but this probably holds for everybody and I try to follow it myself. There's lots of issues out there. The problems of the world in the next 25 years uh, are not going to be solved by the government, uh, many of them, because the government doesn't have the money, but it, they, they, they will be solved like people by people in this audience, by all of us. So my advice is find a cause that you have a passion for. That's number one. Uh, and many people in this audience are already doing that, obviously, in a, in a big, important leaders. Mm -hmm. But find a cause that you have a passion for and get involved. And don't hold yourself back yeah, I'm talking to students now because you think you don't have the skills or expertise. What you're going to learn is the private sector desperately needs business skills, organizational skills, management skills. You can have an enormous positive impact sitting on a nonprofit board, advising a nonprofit leader. All the things you're learning in business school are applicable, I've found. Uh, to nonprofits. So find a cause you, but the trick is find something you believe in and you have a passion for and get involved. You will make a big difference in the world. Thanks, Rob. Um, so we had a number of pre-submitted questions and I'm now looking at what's in the Q&A. Okay, good. Um, I thought I would tee up one of the pre-submitted ones while I'm uh, choosing uh, because there were some other questions I see Andrew Changu, uh, like one of our pre-submitted, a couple of questions about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Right. Anything you might want to say about that? So the, the comment I'd make uh, is uh, I've done a deep dive, not surprised, wouldn't surprise you in the last number of years, uh, on, on understanding cryptocurrencies, digital currencies. We're a large payments operator, as many of you know. 
uh, we have uh, responsibilities for oversight of the payment system. And the, the only comment I'd make, I segment crypto from digital currency. So crypto right now, Bitcoin being the most prominent, uh, is it's, it's, it's spawned blockchain and some great technologies, but it itself, it's a store of value and many people own it because they're worried about, they want an alternative to paper currencies and they're concerned about that. Um, it has not yet been widely, not yet been widely adopted as a source of payments uh, because it's so volatile. Mm -hmm. Digital currency, on the other hand, which a lot of countries have been talking about, is explicitly tied to the underlying currency, is specifically designed for payments. Uh, and, and we've said publicly at the Fed, we're doing a lot of work on that. Uh, and, uh, and all I would say is the world is evolving. You're going to see more adoption of digital currencies, other currencies. We already, in effect, our payment system is already heavily right. digital right. and the technologies, particularly like blockchain, distributed ledgers, are already being widely used in, in areas beyond financial services. And I think you're going to continue to see that accelerate. So this is a little related. Emily Hostler asks whether uh, the, the recent purchases in cryptocurrency are perhaps an alternative signal of inflation hedge compared to gold or other traditional alternatives? And um, so, I thought that was an interesting question. Yeah, so uh, I'll stay away from the asset allocation parts in the, this okay. job, I'll, I'll be careful about that. But yes, it's uh, for some, I know it's an alternative to, uh, to gold. Uh, crypto is a, another alternative and from an asset allocation point of view as a hedge. Uh, it's highly, Gold has an underlying value, ultimately, at least production costs. Crypto, what's a challenge for some, which is a cautionary challenge, is it doesn't actually have an underlying inherent value. And so people just need to be careful as they, uh, as they make decisions about that. Okay. Um, a, a question from Stephen LeBlanc um, and a couple of others similar to it. It uh, has to do with if the Fed intends some change in monetary policy, how does that get signaled in a way that doesn't shock the market? And a related question might be, Rob, given that it's committee decision, uh, someone asked how much influence you personally have. Okay, good. Uh, so um, for me, uh, the, the way to avoid a person asked with about the, the, the shock, uh, ideally you want to do things gradually. Mm -hmm. You want to communicate them in advance. Uh, you want to be clear on our reaction function. You want to do things gradually. This is why I've said many times, while you may not want to be too preemptive uh, in taking action, you don't want to be so reactive as being late. And I think that balance is critical. And each of us, including me, comes out in a different place. So here's my experience in terms of influence around the FOMC table. Yes, it is a group, but my experience is it's a highly effective group, high functioning group. Uh, we all talk regularly with each other. We meet every six weeks. We spend a lot of time together. We have very good process politics or political considerations, internal and external, do not factor. If I've got something to say, I speak up, even if even if uh, it's a different view than everyone else. Uh, I don't. I, my experience is uh, no one is unduly influenced by the chair, and the chair wants it that way. The chair wants debate and disagreement. And while we rotate the vote, my experience is whether you're voting or not is probably not a good indicator. Your, your influence is like it is in a business or in a classroom with a group of 15 people around the table. You, you influence people to buy the power of your arguments uh, and, and how uh, insightful you are. And, uh, but this is a group where we learn from each other. We listen to each other. It's, uh, it is a group decision and there's a consensus element involved. That doesn't mean we don't disagree, but we ultimately come to a consensus. And so I'm part of an ensemble cast. 
Uh, things don't always go the way I want them to, but I always have my say, and I've always got the ability to try to influence the decision. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail. Thanks, Rob. Um, Fernando Hernandez wonders if you can speak to the south of our region and talk about Mexico's recession yeah. and that effect on the Texas or regional economy yeah. in the near term. So even going into the pandemic, Mexico had, had had a lot of challenges. And I spent a lot of time in Mexico with the governor of the central bank there and in the country. And they, we have him and, and their group up here. So they've had lots of currency fluctuations. Their domestic interest rate, while ours was, uh, you know, uh, while our rate was much lower, th their domestic Fed funds rate might have been five, five and a half percent. Why? Because they need to pay a higher rate because they're worried about currency outflows and currency fluctuations. What, uh, and the trade tensions were having a significant effect and they worried there pre-pandemic about investment. Then the pandemic happens. Where we contracted last year, let's say in the neighborhood of two and a half percent, they contracted more in the neighborhood of 8%. Why? Didn't have the capacity for fiscal response that we did. Oh. Mm -hmm. They also have much more widespread uh, spread of the, of, the, of the virus. Living conditions were such, if one member of your family gets it, you're going to spread it to a number of other people. And many of their workers had to work in person-to-person -person contact industries and were much more vulnerable. And obviously, as we come out of this, then there's a the question, not just for Mexico, but the rest of the world, the vaccines, the rate of vaccinations. And, and the, much of the emerging world is lagging. And so therefore the spread and the issues of the virus are still much more lingering and substantial. And so this has been a very challenging time, not just for Mexico, but many emerging countries, but particularly for Mexico. So maybe this is related. Uh, there's a question about, um, and it has an opinion in the question around uh, this is Narayan Mani, and thank you, um, that the U.S. debt perhaps is dangerously high and keeps going up, but this isn't a U.S.-only phenomenon. There are countries globally that have had to increase their government debt in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Yeah. And the specific question is, what could individual investors do to insulate <laughs> their retirement portfolio from the perceived massive global bubble. But I think my more general question is, uh, what do you think about uh, debt levels in the U.S. and other countries and our ability to get enough growth to make that less troubling? So if you ask me in February of 2020, and for those of you who will follow my speeches, I made the point pre-pandemic, the level of U.S. government debt, the path is likely unsustainable. Okay. Not only at that time, I said, I think something like 77% of debt of GDP and then 65 trillion of unfunded entitlements. So what's happened? Then we had the pandemic. And because of extraordinary actions, understandable, we're now up 100% and the present value of unfunded entitlements is still 65 trillion. We're going to have to find ways to moderate our debt growth. But so, and there's a lot of sensitive topics, entitlement reform, revenues, super sensitive, yeah. other ways. But one of the ways you can also moderate debt growth as part of the puzzle, got to grow faster. Mm -hmm. All right. And that means faster workforce growth, better productivity, which is why I harp on as we emerge from this, we're going to have to find ways to grow the workforce faster. Immigration, ultimately a very sensitive topic, but it has to be part of the discussion. And we've got to find ways to invest in our early childhood literacy, skills training, infrastructure, access to Wi-Fi. All these elements are critical if we're going to moderate our debt growth. And when I say debt growth, I mean debt divided by GDP. Right. Uh, we've got to flatten it and everything's got to be on the table, but find ways. To, we've got to grow faster than we were in order to address this issue. You mentioned infrastructure, and there's a couple of questions, including from Maria Garati uh, and several others about not just national infrastructure investment, but 
the Texas ice storm that was quite crippling for a week. Right. Um, do you have any views about those investments yeah. and so, yeah. how long how long our week long disruption uh, is so, lasting and effects on whether people want to move to Texas? So let's 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 separate two. There's two questions there. Let me take the big one, then I'll talk yeah. about Texas and what just happened. Uh, country obviously our sense was uh, China is probably a couple of trillion or more overinvested in infrastructure. The U.S. is similarly underinvested in infrastructure. And I talked about GDP growth. Uh, there's government spending that goes to stimulate current spending that has the effect of causing a bump and then back down to trend growth. Infrastructure spending, if it's targeted and done right, could actually improve sustainable GDP growth. And uh, by the way, a lot of it doesn't have to come from government money. Some of it can come from the private sector mm -hmm. through private public partnerships. But these infrastructure spending projects, if they're done, Wi-Fi being at the top of the list should help improve sustainable GDP growth. Now let's go to the Texas situation. Uh, we, are, we, uh, we are vulnerable in the country to underinvestment in infrastructure. We learned in Texas here an extreme event which was un, which is unpredictable. We found that not only was the grid not weatherized across sectors, but most businesses and homes, separate from the grid problems, were also not weatherized. That's why you had so many homes with businesses with pipes bursting. And so it just reminds us, I'm confident the legislature, and I've talked to the governor about this and others, this is priority number one. We will make the investments, I'm confident, and we have the money to make the investments that will address this. But it's sort of an, it is an example of how, why infrastructure is so important. Um, uh, but I'm confident in Texas will make these investments. And I know the governor and other leaders uh, have made this a top priority to, to, to weatherize the grid, change procedures to make sure that, that this doesn't happen again. Great. And uh, Brad Belden and actually, in addition, a pre-submitted question, wanted to get a little more color on your comment about our supply chain difficulties in, say, lumber, microchips, rare right. earths. And can you just say more about uh, which sectors are going to free up quicker and slower right. and uh, what's the overall impact? So, so the only way I know how to go at this, which is what we've done here at the Dallas Fed, is I talk to every different industry. So for example, semiconductors is a subject in and of itself, but it's affecting uh, cars, production yep. runs. And the long and short of it, people in that industry tell me, and it's changing a little bit, they were telling me first maybe within 12 months, now it's lengthening. They're thinking it's closer to maybe 12 to 24 months. There's more uncertainty and the CapEx needed, you know, in the tens and tens of billions of dollars, very expensive to get this production, but we'll eventually resolve it, but it's going to take longer. Uh, petrochemicals is another example that goes into uh, couches and all sorts of other things. This is where the weather freeze probably set them back six months and set back the whole supply chain issue. Uh, lumber and all these other products, many of these industries tell me, again, within the next 12 months, plus or minus, they're hopeful. But I got to say, what, what they're struggling with, if, if I could fix demand and tell you where there wouldn't be any intervening events, I think it's, it's much easier for people to say, okay, within the next 12 months, what's happening is demand is shifting. There's more fiscal policy coming. Demand could be strengthened for some of these products. And that's actually creating some of the uncertainty uh, in some of these supply chain logistics where demand is not static, it's increasing, and there's intervening events. And that's why there's just uh, uncertainty about how long it's going to take in a lot of these sectors. Great. Um, well, let's see. I'm looking. We're at 1245, which is when we said we would end, but you are so generously uh giving us another 10 minutes and we're going to use it uh there was at least one question about uh china and i'm having trouble finding it so i'm just going to tee up the word china Fine. and other than what comment you said about their infrastructure what else would you like to say so 
so r- r- rightly, uh, we are very concerned uh, in this country that China is a competitor. Uh, they're active in the world. They're trying to change standards in, in the globe. And then we've got all the issues of level playing field, technology transfer, and intellectual property rights. The only comment I would make is we fight this battle and we're, and, and also cooperate with them. We're going to have to learn to do both. Right. We're going to have to compete with them, have tensions, and we're going to have to cooperate where it's appropriate because it's a big market and important partner for some of our companies. Uh, they've got issues of their own is what I was going to say. They have a a significant issue of high level of debt to GDP, and they have a worse aging problem than we do. We have a real problem with aging workforce. Their problem is also significant, and it was made worse by the one child rule. So I'm optimistic while we compete with them and we have these tensions, we've got a lot of competitive advantages also versus them, and they've got their own set of challenges, uh, including environmental remediation in Beijing, Shanghai, and the country. So... uh, uh, I'm still optimistic about the uh, opportunities for the U.S. Thanks, Rob. Um, Michael Moores wants to know what threats you see to the U.S. dollar maintaining its position as the preferred global reserve currency. So, uh, and this is critical because why are we able to have such high debt to GDP and issue? It's because people overweight to the dollar. And we shouldn't take it for granted. It's known as the exorbitant privilege. It allows us to finance at relatively low rates, but we'd be wise not to rely on this going on forever. What could change it? Uh, Technology, uh, technologically developments that maybe uh, even some unforeseen that give people alternative ways of transacting away from the dollar. China certainly uh, although they've got to go through a lot of reforms, if they were able to, over the next number of years and decades, make those reforms, uh, they are actually, with their digital dollar, trying, or digital currency, I should say, digital yuan, trying to use that more for global payments. People are speculating. And so uh, there could be a whole range of developments. I think the point of it is, uh, I think we'd be wise not to take for granted in our activities. We need to moderate our debt growth, find ways to grow faster. And, and I think while I'm hopeful that we'll, our dominance will last for many years, I don't think we should rely so heavily on that, on that assumption. Uh, Rob, Betty Hewell wants to ask how uh, should we, and if so, how incentivize women back into the workforce and is the solution Uh, some sort of paid FMLA, or will just getting the public schools and private schools fully open again uh, resolve much of the problem? So we've done a lot of work on this here, and we've done a lot of, uh, and we've done a lot of surveys, and what have come to the conclusion, it's one, getting schools reopened in person, but Mm -hmm. that's not enough. Second thing is child care. And uh, I never thought I'd be studying the child care industry, but I've done a deep dive on it this last year. And it's a very fragile industry. Mom and pop, the people who work in it are relatively at the low end of the wage scale. And most women feel like even if their kids are in school in person, what do you do from three o'clock to six o'clock then? Mm -hmm. And they don't have, either they don't have great access or it's not affordable. And so I think getting this childcare ecosystem fixed uh, is going to also be critical. And the last comment we see is transportation got to do those two things. And then in some cases for at-risk groups, uh, ways to help them. And a number of nonprofits are doing this, like on the road lending, helping at-risk groups, particularly women with children, find a way to get to the job. Those are the three comments I'd make. Okay. Well, Rob, we're getting close to the end. And I loved that you talked to students So I'm going to leave you with an opportunity to offer more career uh, input. Ivan Perez is a recent college graduate, and um, his specific question was, what advice do you have about networking? But I would tee it up differently. How can one grow up to be Rob Kaplan? Well, so so don't try to grow up to be Rob Kaplan is the best (laughs) way. Figure, Figure out your strengths and weaknesses which is not easy to do. In order to figure that out, you're going to have to get have people that observe you who will tell you things you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people who love you and care about you will do that. Not a lot of those people for each of us. So cultivate those people. And then second, where do you have a passion? Where, where do you shine? What, where are you at your best? What are the tasks? What's the environment? Passion is the rocket fuel that drives high performance. And the key is finding a good mix between your strengths and weaknesses and your passions. Uh, high performance and successful careers don't happen in a year or two. They're built on year after year after year of consistent performance and, and doing something that fits your skills that you have a passion for. Uh, is the only way you're going to sustain it. All of us, including me, I can tell you, have rough days, weeks, sometimes months, but what gets you through it is passion, loving what you do, loving the mission, loving the task. And that's what you should be working to try to do in these next number of years after you graduate. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time, and I am so grateful for how generous you were with sure. your reasoned opinions with your time today. Um, I, I'm given a chance to s express what my takeaway is. And I'm thinking about our Center for Leadership and Ethics, where our series Ethics Unwrapped spends a lot of time talking about the difficulty of speaking unpopular opinions, expressing a view when there's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, Rob Kaplan, my biggest takeaway is that I feel in good hands because you have the character to lean into hard conversations, even in the face of uncertainty. And I feel grateful for your service to the Federal you're, Reserve. You're, off, you're awfully nice to say that, Will. Today. So I want to thank all the listeners that tuned in. We are and have recorded this session so that you can review it later. And um, with that, I want to thank everyone who attended and the alumni I want to send a hook and horns to. And I look forward to our next conversation, Mr. Kaplan. So right, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Lil. Thank you, everybody. Good to talk with you.